How many of you ever feel stressed out, worried, frazzled, living like you're in a hurried, worried pace? Anyone? Okay, three of us will admit it. Most of us feel it, don't we? It's unfortunate. You know, listen, we're on the go, go, go these days. And what I want to try to convey to you here is your phone. I love the phone. Anyone love the phone? I love my phone, man. Look, you wouldn't let your phone get this way and stay that way. So what are we doing with our lives? Huh? We need to recharge, re-energize, unplug from time to time, and get back into it, right? But right now, we are on the go, go, go. And here's the reason why we're on the go, go, go in our society is because there is this whisper in our heads that nobody ever talks about, but you know it to be true, and it's this. You're not enough. You are not You're not enough. You're not strong enough. You're not fast enough. You're not good looking enough. You're not tall enough. You're not short enough. Whatever it is in terms of you're not enough. And it leads to stress, anxiety, worry, social comparisons, and really a joyless state of living. And that's not how we're designed to live. At the end of the day, it's to be filled with joy and some peace and to live our lives the way we're called to live, right? But instead, what we do is we pack our schedules and our calendars with activities and board meetings. And honey, you take the small kid, the, the youngest child, to the soccer game, and I'll take the oldest child to the piano lessons. And we'll meet back like at 5.30. Maybe we'll have a quick dinner. We'll microwave it real fast because then we got to go to that activity and then that activity. Then we got to go see our cousin. Then our nephew's coming over. And then, hey, Aunt Jane's coming over. And then oh, we got to, you know, meet, the, meet at the board for the church, you know, because I committed. I volunteered. And oh, yeah. We got the small group on Thursday night, and we pack our schedules and our calendars. And then all of a sudden, Jane calls and said, hey, we got a new car. And, you know, your husband says, hey, we need a new car. We need to upgrade our new car. Well, we just upgraded our new phones. Well, we got to upgrade. Where are we going to pay for this? Well, we talked about this a year ago. Well, we also talked about we were going to upgrade to a new neighborhood. And so we got all this crazy, crazy stuff because there's this voice that says, hey, man, I'm enough too. I just want everybody to know I'm enough. And when I look in the mirror, I want to know that I'm enough. You know, and so what we do is we end up taking a vacation. This is crazy. Away from our life. What? That doesn't even make any sense. But we need a break from our life before we come back to our life. But we're such in a hurried, worried, stressful state on our vacation. We don't even know how to rest from our vacation that when we get back from our vacation, we need a vacation from our vacation. So what is the cure? I don't have even half the answers, if that. But there is a big practical strategy from Scripture that I read this, it's called the Bible. And if you're not a church person, we're so glad that you're here today. I'm not the minister here. The great and one and only Danny Schaffner is super sensitive and kind to everybody here. He's a real smart guy too. And so you're just welcome here, even if you're not a religious person. But I read the Bible. If that offends you, that's okay. I'm, I'm an equal opportunity offender, as you're going to find out here. And uh, it's okay. And so scripture, okay, I read this, and there's a big practical strategy, and the reason why it's going to be able to help decrease the anxiety and the stress and the worry and the hurry in our society is because it has to do with your time. Everybody say time. Time. It has to do with your time. As your time goes, so goes your life. As your schedule goes, so goes your life. And what scripture calls it is a Sabbath. Now, I don't want you to freak out about, oh, my gosh, a Sabbath? I don't have time to take a Sabbath. What's a Sabbath? That's like a Bible word, isn't it? So it just simply means this, and profoundly, that, hey, I'm declaring to the world for this season or for this time or for whatever my Sabbath is, a period of time, that God is enough. Now, that will offend people who don't believe in God, but again, that's okay. And it will also offend, this next part, Christians, okay? And this is why. You're enough. But I have Christians fight me on that all the time. I'm not enough. Pound me with a Bible. What are you, like, no, God is enough and you are enough. And that is where you find peace in a Sabbath rest. Because frankly, when I take a day off, if it's not like that, and I'm not integrating that belief that God is already enough, and I'm playing with house money, and that I'm enough, and I'm playing with house money, then I'll just overthink and be sad on a day off. So you've got to enter a Sabbath season and a time and a period the right way. And we're going to look at an old psalm, like written a long time ago, by, uh, it's in Psalm chapter 90, you might think it's David, but it's Moses who writes this song. And he has a lot to say about time and experience 
Even though your time is finite, the way you experience time doesn't have to be finite. It can be infinite. Remember when you smiled at the girl and she smiled back in a flash of a second, but it stayed with you forever? You can slow time before it's too late. And that's what we want for you today is to slow time. And he also instituted the Sabbath. Look what he has to say about time. Psalm chapter 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. So all Moses is saying there is, God, you are enough. You're enough. Hey, turn to somebody and say you're enough. Go ahead. I mean, say that like that, but leave it. Okay? Hey, you have been our dwelling place. God, you are enough through all generations. Meaning, hey, you, you, you like, you, you're just enough. Through all generations. In fact, they instituted a whole day called the Sabbath. Once a week for 24 hours at a time, this is mind-blowing to our culture, you just put down the tools and you don't do any more work. You don't pick another grape, you don't pick another grain, you don't harvest another olive. You just stop and you rest and you recharge, you unplug, you play, you enjoy your experience. And listen, it, you know, it's not about not working or don't working because, listen, Jesus even worked on the Sabbath from time to time. And it's not about being lazy either, but it's about rather saying, I'm planting the flag to declare that my God is enough and that I am enough. Even if other people don't think that I'm enough, God thinks that I'm enough. Get it? Anybody with me? Yes. You're enough. But you're living with a small voice that's pushing you into chaos. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are our God. So he brought forth the world not out of determinism, but out of free choice, which means he chose you. Like he decided somewhere that we're worth it, that somehow you and I are enough to keep into existence, to bring into existence, and in all of his everlastingness. And, you know, we still feel like we're not enough, even though you hear, hey, yeah, God chose me, that's cool and all, but I still feel pretty sad inside. And Moses felt the same way from time to time. In fact, Moses had about 120 years of his life, and there was four stages of his life where he didn't feel like he was enough. Look, he was born into Pharaoh's house, so he was born with plasma screen TVs, salt rooms, saunas, hot tubs, drove around Hummers. He had it all in the Egyptian palace. And then one day he killed an Egyptian, and he thought, oh, my gosh, I'm not enough anymore. They got a bounty on my head. So he runs into the second phase of his life, which was a shepherd. And so he wakes up every morning, and for four hours he just watched the sun come up and then go across the sky during the day and then go down. And he would watch sheep all day long. And that was his existence for 40 years. Years. I mean, the first four weeks must have been quite peaceful. But for 40 years, he was all alone doing all that. And he didn't know he was going to be Moses. He didn't know what his life was going to unfold to. He had no idea. He just thought, man, I'm just a dude. I watch the sheep. I'm going to watch another sheep have a baby. I might have a couple babies. Maybe not. And then I'm going to be snuffed out of existence. Nobody will ever remember who I am. And then that leads him into another phase, if you've read your Old Testament, God, and, and if you're not a church-going person, it's, this is going to sound kind of weird or maybe creepy, and that's okay. You're always welcome here. And it's like God, the Bible says, spoke to a dude. And Moses heard him, and God said, hey, I want you to go to the epicenter of reality right now and go eyeball to eyeball with one of the most powerful people on the planet, Pharaoh, and I want you to tell him without any weapons to let my people go. And what did Moses reply with? I'm not, I'm not enough. I can't speak well enough. I can't lead well enough. I can't do what you want me to do well enough. Go pick somebody. And so you end up picking Aaron, but Moses went along with him. And that led him to the third phase of his life where he led this entire nation, a crowd of thousands and thousands of people, hundreds of thousands, out of Egypt into a desert. They walked around the desert, all this place, to a place that he said, hey, we're going to go to a land that's called the promised land. I will take you there. It's going to be, it's going to be epic. And the crowd, you know, the first four weeks, they're all excited. Four months, they're excited. Probably four years. But for 40 years, Moses would not stop and ask for directions. So the crowd, they kept saying, hey, you're inadequate. You're not a good enough leader. You don't lead us well enough. Stop and ask for directions. He's like, I'm not. I'm a man. I'm not going to ask. You know, whatever that happened, they complained and complained and complained. And Moses was just like, just give me the sheep again. Just give me. How many of you ever just want to hang out with sheep rather than people? Okay. I mean, Moses feels us. 
And then he gets to the edge of the promised land. It's so sad. Like he sees the goal. They made it. But he's not young enough or healthy enough or whatever enough to go in, and he dies. So he resonates with time and experience, and he's got a great perspective on time that he's going to teach us here in this really old psalm that's going to change your life. In fact, at least a dozen people came to me after service and said, you preached my life in 25 minutes. I wish I'd heard it 30 years ago. It's Moses. Listen to this. You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. Now, this sounds like Gandalf the Grey, the way she reads it, right? <laughs> Thou shall not pass, right? But what he's saying here, Moses is like, man, every human being gets a finite amount of existence. That's it. Yeah, it the clock's ticking. The sands of time, they're, they're ticking. And uh, Moses was right. He turned back to dust. So here's a question for us today. From this day forward, what will you do and how will you spend your life before you turn back to dust? I hear this all the time in my profession. I thought there'd be more time. We got divorced. I didn't know she was going to serve me the papers. I thought there'd be more time to forgive and connect. Mom died. I thought there'd be more time to call home. And I just didn't do it. I thought there'd be more time. We took the kids off to college. We drop them off. Mom and dad walk away from college. And they just say to each other, I thought there would be more time for parks, picnics, and play dates. We thought there would be more time. Guys, I don't know you all that well. But listen, you know this to be true intuitively. If you and I don't get a handle on how to slow down time, it will spiral out of control. And you'll spend your existence stressed out, anxious, worried, and in a hurry. You know what I'm saying? A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. So a watch was three hours as a shepherd, and he was a shepherd, and three hours, he's just simply saying here, God, my life is like three hours to you. It's like three hours, because for you, you're everlasting to everlasting. You didn't have a beginning, you don't have an end, so if I think the years are flying by in my life, what's it look like to a God who never started or stopped? It's like a thousand, you know... So as I age, Moses says, the years get by faster and faster and faster. Do you find that to be true? It's going by faster. And, and so Moses is like, you know, what are we going to do about this? In today's world, you live about 87 years on average. That's the average lifespan. Out of those 87 years, 27 years are spent sleeping. From those 27 years, they, they calculate that seven years are lying in bed at night worrying. I have no idea how they get this data, but they, I read about it, Okay. Four hours are spent driving, 11 hours, or not hours, but years, four years, and then 11 years are spent surfing the net combined with watching TV, and 10.5 years are spent working, and then you got miscellaneous years for getting dressed and brushing your teeth, and then that, that leaves about eight years to work on your life's work or your passion if you feel like you're not in it right now. And if you break it down even further, there's 1,440 minutes per day or 8,400 seconds per day to do with whatever you want to do. Can I submit an idea, uh, not just to take a full 24 day, you know, 24 hours off, but to practice a mini two-beat Sabbath, a heartbeat Sabbath, as often as you can. And what I mean by that is, You know, two extra heartbeats. When you walk into a room, instead of just going right to a seat, scan the room for two extra heartbeats and take it in. What's God, maybe God's want to say something. Maybe you just want to appreciate life and reality at that moment. Maybe you're going to see the love of your life in that moment. I don't know, but you take it in for two heartbeats longer. You know, the next time you guys walk out, if you're married and you're walking out of the house, you say, honey, I'll see you later this afternoon, or I'll be home after work. That if you would just look at her for two extra heartbeats, because I can tell you this, that she is waiting for you to look at her for the first time in 15 years again. 
It's been too long. But if you could just look at her again for just those two extra heartbeats. Or if you have kids or you got grandkids and you're telling stories as a grandfather or grandmother, you walk in and you're reading a story to them, you know, and they're like, oh, thank you, Papa. Thank you, Mama or Grandma. If you just listen to that for two extra heartbeats longer, if you would savor the food for two extra heartbeats longer, you're like, Aaron, this is so earthy. That's where where we're at. That's how God created us, right? So to take it in, two extra heartbeats, because life unfolds in the precious moments, the divine moments of the divine context in his freedom and in our freedom in the now. Two extra heartbeats longer. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. And in the morning it springs up new, but by the evening it is dry and withered. Okay, so that's so depressing, let's just go home. I mean, it is. It's like what Moses is saying here, like, God, look, I know you designed everybody, and they have a finite amount of time. Nobody's getting out of this alive. We don't know how long they're going to live. And, and, and look at this little picture here. We don't know how much sand anyone has. It doesn't matter how famous or celebrity. It doesn't matter how private you are. It doesn't matter. You, we, nobody knows, right? You, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. But you and I need a reminder every now and then. Because Moses is saying it's like a baby who's born. You're like, oh, man, this baby's so cute. This baby's got this whole life ahead of it. And Moses is saying, gone. Your grandma and grandpa thought just the way you're thinking sitting here. Or wherever they sat. I got all, I got it all. They're gone. It's our turn, right? That's always saying here. It's like the new grass. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, for they quickly pass and we fly away. So our days may come to 70 or 80 years. I don't know if that's true or not because I don't know if all of us will live that long. In fact, most of the people that I have worked with in my life, they live to about 25 years old and then they die. We just don't get around to burying them until they're about 85 because they sold what God planted and sowed in their heart and their dreams to go work for somebody else's dreams. And I'm not saying that's necessarily bad, okay, because you got, you got to make things happen. But when did you stop, right? When, when will you live again? When will, you, when will you breathe in what God has called you to live out, right? And, and we just quickly... We just quickly pass, and you can get it back. You can get the fire back, the passion back, the purpose back, your life's work back. When you have like a day, and I'm, i got to be honest, I'm not the best. I'm, more, I'm better at the two-moment heartbeat than I am a whole day because it drives me crazy to take it off. But I'm a product of my culture, right? But you can get it back when you set aside a time. Maybe it's 24 hours for you, and I'm not legalistic about it, nor does the Bible. 24 hours of time every week that says, listen, listen, listen. In that 24 hours, don't overthink. It's not about being lazy. But if you want to kick your feet up, it's okay to do that. Because most people, they're working so they can do that in retirement. I mean, take a day every week. It's okay. You don't even know if you're going to make it there. Right? So to take a time and say, what's my purpose again? What's my life's work? Let me, let me call a friend. Let's hang out. Let's go do this. Let's, let's love. Let's go to the nursing home. Whatever it is for you, right? Before, before it's all over. What was that verse again? Fly away. Now, if you want to slow down time, besides the Sabbath, besides the two unfolding moments, this is one that I use. It's a great song. I usually preach it, you know, preach a message at a funeral, and they usually pick this song, right? Ah, fly away. And you're like, oh, my gosh, he can't sing. You're right, I can't sing, but I love to sing. And, and, and listen, when I'm so anxious, I get anxious. Don't you get anxious? Don't you get worried? Don't you fear? It's, your, it's the amygdala. I won't go into all that, but you do, right? It's trying to keep you alive. And so you're like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. I'll fly away when I die. Hallelujah. Bye. Oh, my gosh, I can't pay a bill. Oh, my gosh, my kid. Oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. What's going to happen with the neighbors? Oh, my gosh, they didn't cut enough of their lawn, and now i got to cut more of their lawn. This is just not fair, and I'm worried and stressed, or whatever it is for you. Ah, fly away when I die. Hallelujah. Bye and bye. Ah, and it just gives a sense of certainty that you have in the future that if you could see it, 
It would melt your hair off if you still have hair, you know. That God's in control. It's going gonna, it's gonna to work out. It's going to be okay. And that's what a declaration of the Sabbath is. It's going to be, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. He just to number our days. And what he's saying there is to live like your days are numbered. We got this couple jars at home. And we fill them or have filled them. I need to refill one because it broke. With little, like, bouncy balls and toys and rocks, one for each of my girls. And every day, would take one, one of those out and put it in my pocket so that when I'm at work or hanging out with a friend or whatever I'm doing, when I hit it, it reminds me I only have so much time with my kid because by the time empty, it, they're about 18 and should be out of my house by then. Not that I want them to leave, but it reminds me that they probably will want to leave. So I only have so much time. I know another person who put a suitcase on his daughter's wall when she was a kid. She's like, I, you know, I don't want a suitcase. I want Justin Bieber. Post, poster Justin Bieber. He's like, you get in a suitcase. Why? Because it reminds me that I'm helping you prepare for life. And one day, you're going to be out of here. And it's a trigger to remind me to hug you and hold you and laugh with you and love you. Right? To live as if your days are numbered. You do this already with some things. Like if you ever got engaged, you're like, you learned how to say no to people. Because now that, that time, that schedule was really important to you that you needed to get everything ready for, for the wedding day, right? Because you had a deeper burning purpose in your heart. But now you say yes to everybody and it has nothing to do with your passion or your purpose. And you're running out of time. You did it with a test, too. Put a test on. You're like, oh, my gosh. Every, i got to say no to other things because i got to study for this test. To live as if your days are numbered. And another way you can slow time is to ask this question. I've put it up in my house, and it's this. If, you know, there's going to be a day where I'm not going to be able to do what I'm about to do ever again. But today will not be that day. And I don't know what that would be for you because I center that question around my joy and what I really appreciate about life. Maybe for you it's, you know, going to the original pancake house. There's going to be a day where I'm not going to be able to have pancakes ever again this tasty. But today is not going to be that day. Who wants to go with me? You know, let's go hang out because that's the stuff of life. You know, there's going to be a day where I'm not going to be able to put my arm around my wife ever again because one of us has to go first, right, or more than likely. And so what I, I just get myself in that state because what happens is we just go through the mundane of life. But one person, G.K. Chesterton, a Christian theologian, said, listen, it's in the mundane where the divine is, but you're separating the mundane life from the Christian life, and it's all part of what God is wanting us to experience. So instead of saying, hey, there's going to be a day where I'm not going to be able to do this and I'm not going to do it now, I'm going to say there's going to be a time where I'm not going to be able to put my arm around my wife, but today will not be that day. So I just go put my arm around her. She's like, what are you doing? I'm putting my arm around you. So I can. You know, or you're visiting a niece or a nephew and you, you're reading that story or you're playing with them. So there's going to be a day where I'm not going to be able to hang out with them, but today will not be that day. If you're a runner or you put and you're lacing up your shoes, and you say, there's going to be a day where I won't be able to run ever again. Let's just make today that day, because I don't want to run. You know, whatever your priorities are. Your priorities are different than mine, and vice versa, and that's okay. I'm not judging. When do we get off judging people all the time? All right. Today won't be that day. And the reason why we can do that is because we are caught in the context of the everlasting to the everlasting. And that gives us meaning and purpose. It's not just random chaos and molecules. To live out our journey for whatever God's putting in our hearts. And Moses is saying, why, why, what if we started living that way? What if we took those two heartbeats longer? What if we took a full 24 hours off every now and then and rediscovered our purpose or our passion or we went and served or we did whatever it is and declared with a flag that says God is enough, I am enough, we are enough, and we're playing with house money, and let's move forward with that. And I tell you why we don't do it. 
It's called atel phobia. Atel phobia is the fear of not being enough. Oh my gosh, I'm going to walk into this room. I, did I get the right dress on? I don't know if I got the right dress on. Did I put the right makeup on? I put too much makeup on? I don't man, I can't walk in that room. I don't make enough money to be in that room. What's going on? We always fear but we're not enough. And you know where this comes from? All over. From when you were a child, you were told, sit up straight, little Johnny, or I'll give you something to sit up straight about. And I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying it is. And what little Johnny hears in that, and plus, little Johnny says, don't cross, you know, he's told, don't cross the street, don't swing from the monkey bars, don't talk to strangers, don't do this. And all of that is well-meaning and maybe even fine. I'm just saying that a child hears, I'm not enough. I can't figure it out. I'm not grown up enough like they are. But one day, I'll be grown up enough to make those kinds of decisions. And they hear it day after day after day. And then when we're a teenager, we're like, hey, go get the great grades. Bring home all A's. So they bring home all A's and one B. And the parents are great. They're great. They're like, man, this is great. Let's go celebrate. Great GPA. But then there's that one moment where the parent says, what happened with the B? And the kid hears, I'm not enough. It's crazy. We're just making it up, too, to make people feel like they're not enough. When God brought you forth from the whole world to say, you're enough, and I want you. It's crazy. And then when we get a little older, we, tell, we get involved in people's dating lives. Hey, don't smoke, drink, or chew, or go with girls who do. And it's like, dang, I already messed that one up. Never going to live up to this. And then when you're a grown up, it's like, be the perfect role model. You know what all this adds up to? You get to your dying days, and if you have time to reflect during that time, you're like, why did I live according to everybody else's expectations? You already saved. What's the big deal? That's what Moses is saying here. So the next time, here's a little challenge. That's a big challenge. And the next time you feel like you're not enough or somebody makes you feel like you're enough or they imply that you're not enough or you won't join this board or you're not volunteering enough or you're not doing this or you don't see, you're not married yet or you don't have kids or whatever, I want you to ask this question. Not enough for who? For who? Because listen, as a believer, as a Christian, and what the church believes is if God sent his son to for you, you enough because God is for you. And if God is for you, you exclamation mark. There is no dot, dot, dot. There is no comma, but you may gain a heart of wisdom. Now wisdom having life literally means perspective in the Hebrew, having perspective to live a life that's well lived. And Bonnie Ware, she's a registered nurse, still alive, and she interviewed dying patients over the course of their last 12 weeks of their life in hospice. And she asked them this one question. Do you have any regrets? And if so, what are they? She compiled it into a book. I'll give you the top two starting with number two. Wish I could so hard. And then she reflected, this came from every male patient that I nursed. They missed their children's youth and their partner's companionship. Women also spoke of this regret. But most were from an older generation because the female patients hadn't been the breadwinners. All of the men, all of them, and I had men crying. They were in their 70s out in the foyer telling me this. All the men I nursed deeply regretted spending so much of their lives on the treadmill of work existence. And your work tries to make it justified. And then it gets to regret number one. I wish I had had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life that other people expected of me. And she reflects on it. Regret of all, when people realized that life is almost over and they look back clear as day on it, it is easy to see how many dreams have gone unfulfilled. Most people had not honored even half of their dreams and had to die knowing that it was due to the choices they made they couldn't blame anyone else now. Health brings a freedom very few people realize until they no longer have it. And I already know the pushback. 
but Aaron, I can't take a day. Because if I take a day off, I won't, I won't have whatever I want to have. I won't have it. I won't experience it. And my question is, what is it? Like, what is it? Well, I don't know, but I got to have it. I think you got your it probably from your parents or your in-laws or some family member or some church or someone. Someone's giving you an it, and it's always right to them, isn't it? They make it feel so important. It's it. And, and we need you to dress like it, and we need you to, you know, get it on your car, report card. And we need you to, so that you can enroll in it university, so that you can buy an it, and then drive an it, and then upgrade to another it, and talk on your it, and upgrade to a better subdivision it. Because everyone else has got the it's. And a lot of parents put that expectation on us, and we don't even know they're doing it. And it's all meaning, I'm not saying that's bad, I'm just saying this is what happens. I think intuitively you know that. And other parents are saying, don't do any it that I did because I messed it all up. And we can't win with our parents. Right? And so the question is, when do you ever feel like you're enough? When? Right? Or I'll never be it. I'll never make it. I'm never enough. We know that if God loves you, that you are enough. Satisfying us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad and happy in all our days. What cracks me up about this is I grew up in a church culture, maybe this is you. Oh my gosh, the Bible's talking about happiness. We're not happy, we're joyful. What, like, what does that even mean? Don't, be, don't live a life of satisfaction, and then you get to the end of your life like, why did I listen to them? Right? In my house... It's expressed differently maybe than in your house. Happiness comes in dance parties. So we just crank the music up really loud. Jumping into my arms, I take the two beats. I can see it in slow motion. For you, it may be something completely different. But here's what I want to communicate to you, however you express slowing down time and living a life of satisfaction. You've already, you're already enough. If you don't get that into your head and into your heart, it will drive you to stress and anxiety and chaos. Long before you were born, from everlasting to everlasting, God had already made some decisions because he anticipated that he was going to be excited that you're enough based on his creation. Long before you, got, you went to high school, long before you got an A, long before you got a college degree, long before you wrote a book, long before you got that job, long before you made six, seven, eight figures, long before you became an entrepreneur, you were already enough. Long before you married her and you're bragging about it, and that's great, but long before that happened, he already thought you were enough. You just didn't think you were enough. There's two kinds of people, okay, two, at least. But one says they're driven by that whisper that never goes away. And so they're like, what else, what else, what else? I'm not it. I don't have enough. I'm not enough. I'm, I can't be enough yet. And they're so stressed. And they're so worried. And they're so anxious. And they're good people. Maybe they're productive and they do good things, but they live in a state of stress and worry. And there's a, another group of people who are, you know, to be fair, the groups are jumping back and forth. It's not easy. There's another group of people that, hey, I, I'm planting my flag in this whole idea that God is enough and I'm enough. And you know what? We're enough. You don't have to make me feel guilty. We're enough. And they are still driven and they are maybe even more productive because they take a day off and recharge and unplug and re-energize and they know their life's purpose. And they know that it's all going to be okay. Right? They know that it's all going to be good. And it's okay joy and satisfaction. And so many of us are limiting our joy, happiness, and our satisfaction. When I get to this level, then I'll be happy. When I'm married, then I can be happy. When I have a kid, then I can be happy. When I move to such and such street, then I can be happy. When I have to experience this or be this, then I can be happy. 
You know, it's okay to experience joy in your life. And this is not some new age, gobbledygook, rah-rah type of stuff. This is called the gospel. And you know what the gospel means? It's good news. Too many of us have been beaten down with bad news where you're supposed to experience the good news. You come here because you need some hope, and Jesus died to give you some hope. Right? I mean, it's crazy. And even the church has systematically, before we even got to this point, has kind of made people... They're just not enough. If you don't read enough of the Bible, if you don't save enough souls, if you don't do, you're just not enough of a Christian. If you don't join the elders, if you don't, or if you don't do this, if you, you're not enough. When in reality, if you were just told that you're already enough, you'd probably be happy you're joining those things, wouldn't you? So you are worthy of God's love. Even if you don't believe in God. You are worthy of God's affection. When you look in the mirror, you are enough. When you you are already enough. Can you improve on whatever you want to improve on in life? Your productivity, your work, writing a book, the way you look? Sure. It's just made up into the particular culture that we got into. We can improve and be enough all at the same time. That's not a contradiction. The foundation is that God is enough and you are enough. So don't let an atheist tell you that God is not enough. But you are already enough, and God is already enough. Don't let materialism or culture say that God is not enough, because God is enough. Or your job or your performance reports that you get back, you can always improve, but you are already enough all the time. You will never be able to improve on your enoughness, because God already you're enough. So we're going to move over here into a time of response. And in this time of response, you can come up here. You can come up here and you can take communion. You can come up here and you can pray. There's two benches up here. Hey, listen, if you're not a believer, again, you're always welcome here. Nobody's judging you. We're all on a journey. If you want to, you can come up here and pray. Even if you don't know how to pray. There's no script. Even the one in the Bible, it's just just a model. And then there's a place to give. Church is doing the best they can with with trying to figure out how to spend it. But their motivation is to help. Do they always get it right if you're an unbeliever here? Give, what are you talking about? They're doing the best they can. So you can pray, you can take communion, you can give in the corners, and you can do any of that at any time while they sing these next couple, three songs. We're so glad you're here. And here's what I'm trying to communicate, and I do such a bad job of it. So we're going to die. Nobody's going to remember me. But God thinks I'm. God thinks you're enough. And it's time to stop beating each other up. You're enough. And the cross is the ultimate punctuation to the self and divine doubt that rattles around in you constantly, that's driving you to chaos, stress, worry, anxiety. It's an exclamation mark to say, God is enough, and I think you're enough. Listen, if you're going to recharge your phone, and it's one of the best inventions of all time. I love it. If you're going to if you're going to treat it in a way that it deserves to be treated to keep it functioning at high capacity. What about you?